the first company speaking tonight, uh, or fund speaking tonight, is Gresham House uh, Energy Storage Fund. Now, Gresham House itself is a very long established uh, investment house going back to 1857. Uh, and has, uh, in recent years, specialised in alternative assets. Now, Gresham House Energy Storage Fund, which amazingly managed to get the mnemonic of GRID, um, uh, was brought to the market in November last year, raised about £100 million. Its target, when fully invested, is a, is a dividend of 7p, which equates to, at the issue price, uh, a 7% uh, yield. Uh, ben uh, Guest is the head of the, uh, of the new energy team at Gresham House. It's got a long experience in this sector, uh, something over 20 years experience. Uh, it's got a, quite a big team helping him on this um, and has a particular interest in uh, energy storage technology and its use in renewables and electric vehicles. So Ben, over to you. Um, thank you very much to Keith and to Hardman for welcoming us this evening. Um, so we, we listed this fund in November of last year um, and the, you know, I'll, I'll spend a couple of seconds on Gresham House. As, as Keith rightly said, um, it's a long established company. Um, it was re-established as an investment trust in the 60s. It was in runoff in the um, earlier part of this decade and was reinvented via a, a management buy-in um, spearheaded by our CEO, Anthony Dalwood, in 2014 and has been reinvented, reinvented as a specialist asset management um, business. And through acquisition, and organic growth, organic growth being an example of this being that, um, it has grown to £2.3 billion from what you could call a st standing start in 2014, late 2014. Um, I don't have enough time to go into any more detail and I prefer to focus on the fund. So um, what, what am I talking to you about today? Um, energy storage is essential infrastructure to enable the installation and um, generation of substantial amounts of renewable energy on the grid um, without waste or exceptional cost. Today we're at 33% renewables on the grid as of last quarter and that's growing very quickly and will approach 50% in the fairly near future. For that you need um, energy storage or the forms of what are more broadly called flexible generation of which we think battery storage is the most compelling to make it happen um, and I'll elaborate in a moment. So what is, what is this as a financial investment? Well, we're an LSE-listed closed-end fund um, investing in, in a portfolio of these battery projects, and I'll, I'll tell you what a battery project is in a moment. Um, we've raised exactly £100 million um, so far, and um, the team is actually pretty heavily invested across the team. We, we have in the region of £15 million invested in this fund. Um, we're targeting a 7p yield, which is a function of the... Um, underlying profitability of the projects, but we're also targeting substantial capital growth. We expect to reinvest some capital into the business, um, and some of the capital growth, we believe, will come from um, really manifestations of what we've seen in so many other areas of infrastructure. Today, the discount rates used to acquire these projects are 12%. We expect these to come down as people get more familiar with these projects and this industry um, and, and are prepared to um, invest in them at lower rates of return, which we hope, of course, will drive the share price, which is actually one of the major rationales for a listed vehicle. Um, so what have we done so far? We've um, invested um, in initial projects that we developed and built out over the last couple of years straight away. So we invested £60 million in total, um, including the fundraising costs um, from the get-go into a 70-megawatt portfolio. And we're not standing still, we're running at building out our portfolio. We've got five megawatts, which is quite small, in construction right now, and expect to build uh, approximately 130 megawatts, subject to further fundraising later this year. Um, one really interesting feature of this is, is that returns aren't correlated to the absolute level of power prices. So if you're worried about where power prices are going, um, you don't have to worry about that in the context of this fund. We're really playing the volatility in power prices which is going to increase as a function of renewables. It's a really crucial point. Another important thing is that this is a merchant business model. We don't apologize for that. A lot of people don't like that, um, but we think it's an extremely compelling one. Um, and we're not, therefore, um, uh, requiring subsidies to make the business model work. I think that's quite important because it means that the, the backdrop for this market is entirely commercial and therefore doesn't cost the consumer anything. In fact, it saves money for reasons I can explain in Q&A if there's time. 
Um, ourselves as managers, um, I've been in this industry for um, over 10 years. We've got an extensive team of 16 people, um, and, um, and we're, you know, we've all been doing this for a long time at all sorts of different levels, from development to fund management to actual technical expertise. So this, this is just a list of the projects. These are the ones that we've acquired so far, and simple descriptions of them. Uh, these are the projects that we're looking to build out. Um, this is the ones in construction. This is the one comes next, and these, these, these ones are definitely foreseen for this year. Again, subject to some fundraising, but we're pretty confident. Um, and then, and then this is another one that will come probably early next year. Um, so clearly, from a starting standing point, starting point of 70 megawatts, we're looking to grow this very substantially. Let me give you a bit of a, um, a comment, though. The renewable, the installed capacity of renewable energy today in the UK is about 43,000 megawatts. So it's grown from virtually zero to 43,000 megawatts in about 10 years. In fact, less than that. Um, here we're talking about piddly sort of hundreds of megawatts of energy storage. Um, this industry is going to be um, mirroring the sort of size of the renewable energy industry in terms of ins installed um, capacity. And whether it's batteries that do it or gas peakers or, or interconnected with other countries, the combination will need to mirror roughly the, the size of the energy generated by renewables because of renewables' intermittency. They can be on or off. And so when they're off, you need something to replace them. When they're generating too much, you need to store it or you waste it. And right now, National Grid is paying approaching £200 million every year to ask wind turbines to switch themselves off and when you're in a valley, to get gas peakers to expensively turn themselves on. It's, it's a very inefficient system at the moment. Um, these are some pictures of what they look like. Gives you an idea. They're extremely efficient in space, actually. Um, a large site um, can occupy between one and two acres. That compares to dozens or even hundreds of acres for renewable projects. They're, they're actually very, very compact. Um, so what's the backdrop to this? Obviously, um, the UK government, uh, well, the, the legislation for this is the uh, Climate Change Act of 2008, which sets the, the, the target of an 80% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050, um, with intermediate targets set by the government along the way. What's exciting is that so far, we've, we've, um, we're on track to meet the first three targets comfortably. Um, the government's finding it much more difficult, and the Climate Change Committee for Climate Change, the CCC, is saying, actually, we're starting to run out of steam. Um, there's a lot that needs to happen, and the three key areas are electricity, where most of the running's been done. The other two key areas are um, petrol consumption, moving to electric will obviously help that, heat consumption in the form of gas, electrification of heat is the, is the main source there. That's really for backdrop, it's, it's not that, that relevant here. Um, so this is the steady trend I was telling you about. We've hit 33%. This is um, effectively biomass. This is wind, uh, onshore and offshore. And this is what's going to do most of the running going forwards. We've got gigawatts of offshore wind, which continue to be subsidized, being installed over the next 10 years. The government reinforced that recently. And the level of subsidies is now so low that it's possible that the government actually make money out of this because it's, it's structured as a contract for difference. In other words, if the um, agreed price between the government and, and, um, and the project owner um, is, is higher, um, sorry, lower than the actual outturn power price, the government actually makes money. It's a CFD. Um, so it's entirely possible that, that this is actually not a very big cost. But creating that structure makes them very bankable and guarantees their, their deployment over the next 10 years. As a result of that, we're going to go from this 33% towards 50%, probably within the next five years. And that's when it gets very interesting. Why does it get very interesting? So I'm going to pause here because it's actually something you can probably study in your own time later. But this is the crux of it. Um, what makes this an interesting area to invest commercially? Well, the simple fact is that you have two things going on. You have a range of different technologies that generate power at a range of different costs. And interestingly, that's not a small range. It's a very large range. And that creates the potential for very low and very high power prices. Um, and the second thing that's going on is that you d you're seeing daily fluctuations in demand. Not quite two to one, but it's, here you have 27 gigawatts as a typical trough in the night. Here you have 47 gigawatts as a typical peak um, in the daytime, in the winter months, anyway. It's a bit lower in the summer months. 
And therefore, in, in, a, in an environment where you have um, a lot of renewable capacity, um, the, the marginal technology that meets the demand is gas here. And that's quite a cheap technology. So the power price will be quite low at night. Here, it's high demand, and we've made an assumption that there's limited solar and wind. This happens all the time, so it's not, it's not a sort of crazy assumption. So here you have high wind, no solar, because we're in the middle of the night, and that's when demand is low. Um, and here you have low renewables in general, because um, that's just an assumption I've made, which is a frequent assumption, and I'll show that in a minute. Here, peaking plants are having to meet the marginal demand. Power prices can go very high. Now, this is describing a very orderly situation. In reality, um, National Grid is trying to balance the market in half-hourly periods in, and, and with, with output varying and being uncertain. Therefore, these are sort of the sensible ranges of about zero short-run marginal cost to over £100 short-run marginal cost. But the reality is that you can go substantially negative or, or well above that. In your minds, if you don't mind, fast forward to a world where... So this, this is going to be a constant. This, this, is, this is pretty much what we're going to keep seeing. Um, peaking plant meeting the marginal demand when demand is high. But imagine a world fairly soon where you have much more renewable power. Um, this wind will move up. Biomass will move up. Sometimes <laughs> it will happen in the day, some solar. What will then start to happen is that gas isn't meeting the marginal demand. It's coal, but coal's coming off by 2025 because that's legislated to happen. So it's going to be maybe met by nuclear. But what if this combination of technologies are all generating 100% um, of what we need, or we, let's say 105%? Nuclear won't switch itself off because they don't. They're technically very difficult to, switch, to turn down very quickly. Renewables, well, they're incentivized. They're going to get paid whether they earn a zero power price or, or a very high power price because they're getting their generation tariff. So what happens then is that they need to be paid by National Grid to turn down. And so you end up with really bizarre situations where power prices can go substantially negative. This is already starting to happen. It's mostly happening not every day, which is what this is trying to illustrate, but you know, on weekends where it's very sunny, very windy or blustery, and demand is very low. So you end up with situations where you can have very high power prices and very low power prices. Now let me tell you, this is the, this is the real world today. Um, these are five, five, minute by, uh, five minute by minute increments. Um, of solar, wind, biomass, and nuclear generation since 2011. So a bit of a choppy chart. It's quite a few megabytes as well. Um, and what you see here is that you see the intermittency of, of renewables here embedded in this chart. And that leads to situations where increasingly you're getting up towards the very upper bands of, of all power being met by renewables. And these bulges here, by the way, are, are the summer months where solar is generating during the daytime and causing problems um, when they're approaching 100% of total generation because you've then got to ask all gas to switch off for a few minutes. Um, it gets very expensive. And at the other end, despite there being 43,000 megawatts of them, they can be generating virtually zero. Let's not forget that 20% of this figure is nuclear. So actually, <laughs> um, in these instances, renewables are generating next to nothing. So you've got this enormous range and therefore, the, the fact that you can have low demand and high generation, or high demand and very low generation, leads to this potential volatility. And this is the profit pool that we're talking about from a merchant perspective. Sorry, just for detail, the, the y axis is I assume here. I, I, I've got it peaking up at less than 70% in, in, on, on the credit conversion. Yeah, and then it's uh, okay, th In that case, we've got slightly different charts here. Um, one won't include nuclear. So I'm, 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 I'm curious as to why that happened. We, we do, yeah, because this includes nuclear, so it, it, with nuclear it gets to 100%. Okay. okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure why we've ended up with different charts. Does everyone have 70% on that chart? <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Um, so th to, the, to the points I was making, um, so far we've only got a very little amount of flexible generation. Batteries are only 500 megawatts. We've got other forms of um, flexible generation, which can help support the, the grid in forms of interconnectors with France, Ireland, the Netherlands, and, and others are contemplated. But they do not, don't perform very efficiently because they're really running their own business model. They don't really care about balancing supply and demand in real time. Um, and then you've got some gas peakers. But gas peakers only deal with situations where there's peak demand. They don't actually help get power off the grid when 
um, when there's excess generation. So you need something for that, and batteries do that very well. But in any case, this speaks to the general need of what this market's going to be. And this is not our forecast. This is the third-party forecast of how, how big this market will be. Now, this might sound fantastical, but actually this rate of growth is very similar to what we've seen in renewables. In fact, it's slower. This speaks to 36-odd gigawatts in 20, 2030. Um, in a far shorter period of time, we've got to the over 40 gigawatts um, of, of um, generation of renewables in the UK. Ben, you've got about another three minutes. Okay, I think we're getting there. Batteries getting cheaper, therefore the projects are getting more profitable. More volatile, cheaper projects, expanding IRRs. Don't you say more than that? <laughs> Um, and then how, how do we position ourselves? Do we put ourselves behind, uh, behind the meter, as they call it, on someone else's premises? Do we co-locate, another expression in industry, with wind or solar projects? Again, something else you could do. Actually, what we think is most profitable is to build your own project connected to your own grid connection on the grid to really capture the extremes um, which manifest themselves in the wholesale power markets, not being tied to another owner of an asset type. I can go into more detail on that. Um, so our revenues, effectively trading, what we call asset optimization. Yet here you're capturing the peaks and troughs of the day. Or you can make your asset available for something called frequency response. Min second by second, National Grid needs to maintain the frequency on the grid at 50 hertz. You can provide that very well with, with batteries. Those are the alternative revenue models. The amount of demand for this is limited, frequency response. It's about a gigawatt market of demand. The opportunity and optimization, as I expressed earlier, um, is in, the, uh, in excess of 30 gigawatts in terms of potential demand. So this is going to be the mainstay market. These are more smaller levels of revenue, so I won't go into the details. And so we expect over 70% of our revenues to come from trading, what I've mostly been describing in my presentation. But frequency response is a lucrative market, which you can do at times of day when you know that frequency um, asset optimization or trading is not so profitable. Um, I, I won't go into this detail. Um, you know, this is where we say we're very cost-focused and we have a very good team um, uh, in terms of the, the level of expertise that we've got, but don't have the time to discuss it in detail. So in conclusion, essential infrastructure, supporting the government to meet its long-term energy transition targets. This, batteries, are, we think, are the winning technology over gas peakers or interconnectors or anything else. And then the attraction of these investments is not just a nice return, very high EBITDA margins, um, but just the asset backing as well, without the need for subsidies. I'll pause there. Um, thank you very much. I hope that was interesting. Can I stay here? Yeah. Yes, we'll take some questions now. Donald is uh, there with, uh, with a microphone, so if you put your hand up, uh, Donald will come to you. So who'd like to ask the first question? Let me ask the first question then. So <laughs> let's talk about the, um, the risk in the capital cost of build and the um, data that there is about the lifespan of the batteries, how reliable that might be. So the, the cost to build these projects is coming down all the time. Um, mainly as EPC contractors, the, the contractors that build these projects, get more accustomed to them as we build them at bigger scale, um, leading to greater potential to, to do things. And actually, batteries have got so cheap now that the auxiliary equipment is actually the majority of the cost, whether it's the concrete or the inverters and transformers and, dare I say, fencing and all sorts of other things. The batteries are now only a quarter of the cost of the project. Um, what was the second question? The longevity, the longevity the of the batteries. Of guarantee There's, around that. Well, there, there are warranties on our batteries, um, warranties on cycle life, so long as you use them in a prescribed way that you agree with the battery manufacturer. So there are standard terms in the battery industry around cycle life, um, uh, around um, you know, the rate of degradation and therefore capacity relative to the beginning of life capacity and so on. Um, and you can model that in great detail actually nowadays um, in the same way that you can for electric cars. Lithium-ion technology... Um, which is what we use, has been around since 1991 um, and in large scale for cars or battery storage um, for at least 10 years now. So it's, it's actually surprisingly mature technology and it's a breeze to maintain compared to mechanical equipment. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, I, was gonna, question? Yeah, I was going to ask a bit more about the technology because hmm. I think the proposition that 
uh, and the problem with renewables for years has been that you generate renewable energy, but it's where you don't want it, when you don't want it. Yeah. So, so batteries clearly the opportunity to store is is you know is is very very attractive. Right. But I'm intrigued about the technology. You're just touching on that. Yeah. Uh, are you using one technology or multiple technologies? I just wonder whether or not the technology for batteries is is, is necessarily reached the point that it's uh, uh, you know uh, it's, its end point in terms of development. Uh, it, it certainly hasn't reached its end point. Um, that being said, the rate of progress in the battery industry is famously slow. Um, batteries need ha have a set of characteristics. They obviously have a cost. They have a cycle life. They have a rate of degradation. Um, they have a peak power capability, um, they have a size, you know, how energy dense they are and how much space they'll take up, um, and, and a few other things that are more operationally sensitive, like temperature ranges and so on. Um, lithium ion probably is approaching its, the limits of what's possible in the, in the real world. Um, but it is in the sweet spot, a particular type of lithium ion, um, which we use, um, and has been around a long time, is, is, is in the sweet spot um, of where the profitability is in this market, which is, and I haven't really touched on design, but we have batteries which are one to one and a half hours long. In other words, we can discharge continuously at the grid capacity for an hour to an hour and a half, in our case, an hour and a half. Um, that is the optimal amount of time to be able to do that. There are other technologies on the horizon that will be um, available probably in the next few years, we hope, when the runtime for a battery might optimally be three or four hours. Now, I suspect what will happen is that when we replace the batteries or upgrade our batteries after seven to ten years, which is roughly the period um, of time that we do that over, we, you will end up with maybe a different technology. Um, it will still be... Uh, uh, it actually be quite a different technology, and it takes up quite a lot more space. And it'll be interesting to see whether you, by then, have much cheaper lithium that competes surprisingly well with what would have otherwise come along, or whether you actually make the switch. So there are lots of things going on and to drive down costs, but it won't be really rapid either. There's no massive discontinuity. Okay, I think there's another, there's another question over there, Please. Donald. Uh, Nigel Hawkins, Harbin Co. Hi, Nigel. Hello, evening to you. Just want to ask about location. I'm interested in your plant location. Am I right in thinking they're correlated to the weak points of the grid? Um, no, and they don't need to be, um, because you can capture the um, instability and, and, and deal with, on behalf of National Grid, with the instabilities in frequency or with... Um, uh, the highs and lows from anywhere in the network. It travels at the speed of light. Um, so that's actually not a necessity. There are, just to, to that point though, there are points on the grid where you have more generation at peak output by wind turbines and so on, where um, there are effectively weak points, constraints. Um, and in, in those situations, renewable plants have to be paid to switch off. If, if we install, and we are installing some in some areas that, are, that have that sort of issue, either because of offshore wind coming onshore near there, um, or other reasons, just onshore wind, um, and you have a lot of this in Scotland as well for obvious reasons, you know, a lot of wind in Scotland, a lot of, um, most of the wind has been installed up there, um, that the battery projects make a lot of sense in that area um, to remove those constraints. Um, we're not necessarily favoring, favoring those as a core part of the business model because it's more attractive to focus on the most economical site um, as a function of the grid connection cost. And so you, where you locate these really is where the grid connection is capable, possible and where you have the capability. Just on a different subject very quickly. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that sudden outages of base low plant are meat and drink to you? Sudden outages of base low plant um, create... Um, Frequency deviations, the very rapid frequency deviations, something the National Grid calls rate of change of frequency events, um, or, uh, or just an event <laughs> in simple terms. Um, yes, that is meat and drink for the frequency response contract. It can also lead to enormous um, uh, spikes in power prices, um, as has happened in the past, in 2016 in particular, where there are some famous events. Um, so yes, short answer. Thank you. Is there one last question? I mean, there will be time afterwards. Uh, Donald, I think 
There's someone you left there. It's just wondering about the the cost uh, competitiveness of of, for instance, exporting energy when there's a surplus. I mean, so basically, if you connect uh, the UK market better with France, the Netherlands, and so on, uh, what's the rate of return uh, in your projects relative to improving that infrastructure? Um, are you talking about the rate of return of installing an interconnector, for example? Basically, whether that's a, sort of a competitive threat to you. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, the reason for that is that um, interconnectors are not forced to behave in a way that is there to capture the peaks and troughs. They tend to operate for long periods of time um, when, when there's a differential, whether it's caused by currency or regulation or something else, and therefore they're not reliable participants in the flexibility opportunity, or haven't been so far. And, and that's actually been tested and, and analyzed. You know, the, what the, the, there's a, uh, as a capacity factor, if you like, you know, how often are they available to deal with situations which, where they would be useful? Um, they, they have not. Um, the, the other point I would make is that um, when there's excess generation as a functional function of a lot of wind or a lot of solar or both, um, we want to export our power via our interconnectors. But guess what? The greatest likelihood is that there's excess generation from solar and wind in other neighboring countries because the weather tends to be similar across Europe. So you end up with a situation where the interconnector is actually not useful. Um, so that's, that's really, um, those are the sort of two, two key points on that. So at, um, my Scandinavian accent, uh, but um, Denmark, Norway and Sweden are pretty closely connected. Sure. Uh, and sometimes the, Denmark will have an excess of power sure. primarily because of wind. Yeah. They send it to Norway and Sweden yeah. who've yeah. got the hydro which they can sort of switch on and on and off as they like. Yeah. So how come that is uh, being done currently? Is it because of different regulations or other differences? No, I, well, I don't know those markets very well, but you know, there are always situations where at the margin they can help. Um, but they're not necessarily, but it could be driven by price differences between the countries. Um, for whatever reason, and I haven't explored those countries in detail, so I can't answer you very coherently. But the interconnectors are used, but they're not necessarily being used effectively for flexibility events. I think that's the main point. Okay, thank you very much. I think she's got a low battery, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's just why it keeps going off. Uh, ben, you thank you mind. very much. There's obviously a chance to ask questions uh, afterwards. Thank you very much. Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So, uh, so the next uh, company is Shield uh, Therapeutics. Uh, we've got Tim Watts, the CEO, to speak. Uh, this company um, IPO'd in uh, 2016 and has delivered on all its goals uh, set at the time. Uh, principal product is Ferrocru, which is a simple treatment for iron deficiency. Um, it fits uh, very easily into normal clinical practice. It's clinically proven, generating sales. I guess the key for investors from here on is the commercialization of the product. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a small correction. I'm the CFO rather than the CEO. So, uh, one letter out. <laughs> so, uh, Shield is aimed listed, as uh, has just been said. Um, we pre prepared this pack covering February. We were, had a market cap of about 59 million uh, at the end of January. We're now up to about 65 million. Our primary focus is uh, on developing and commercializing a product called Ferrocru, which is for the treatment of iron deficiency. It's a very novel uh, treatment. Uh, commercially, we have already outlicensed that to Norgene, which is a private uh, pharmaceutical company which um, sells and markets around, uh, around Europe. They also have a presence in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we have um, submitted a US uh, new drug application, the so-called PDUFA date, which is when the FDA say they will give us an answer to the um, review, is the 27th of July of this year. Um, and in the background, we have another late stage asset, um, which um, partly because this company is, as you'll see in a minute, something of a recovery stock, and we had a very difficult year last year. Uh, development of that stopped for a while, but we're starting to uh, put some energy back into that uh, now. Uh, we are a semi-virtual company, um, there's only 15 employees, um, about half of that is what I would describe as the more senior management uh, and a fairly experienced uh, team there. When we did that Norgene deal last September, uh, we brought in £11 million as an upfront uh, payment and that means that we are comfortably funded into uh, 2020. 
whenever we present, we find we need to tell people about the last, uh, the last 12 months. And you can see there that 12 months ago, or just over 12 months ago, we were riding high with a share price of, of over a pound. Uh, and um, the day that a clinical study into chronic kidney disease results came out, that price dropped, uh, as you can see, fell off a cliff. Uh, and, and then settled for a while at around sort of 15, 20, 20 pence. Um, the issue there was a, a very unfortunate set of circumstances. The reality has been, and I can come to this later, is that the drug itself was absolutely fine, and the study, when all the work had been done to understand it, produced exactly the results that we wanted. So uh, there was a, because of the way that the news came out, and we had, obviously as a public company we had to announce it, uh, people lost confidence. Uh, so the investment proposition really at, at, at the bottom here is, is that this is a recovery uh, stock and that the recovery of the business from the consequences of that uh, initial announcement of the chronic kidney disease um, has not yet been uh, fully reflected in the share price. And what you can see as you go from uh, left to right there is that um, although that the, the announcement came out in, in uh on the 5th of February, on the 16th of March, the full analysis had been done, and that showed, in fact, that the study had succeeded in meeting all its primary endpoints. Uh, but at that stage, I guess the market was, was, was pretty fed up with the company and had been let down, and so uh, there was no sort of immediate recovery. Uh, at the end of March, the European Union actually extended the usage for which we can, uh, the indication for which we're allowed to use uh, Ferrocrew. Previously, it had been um, limited to people with um, inflammatory bowel disease in Europe, uh, suffering from anemia. The end of March last year, the European Union extended that uh, approval to treating all iron deficiency in adults, whether or not you had anemia. So that is, um, is huge, uh, increases the mar market substantially. Moving further along, uh, in September, we licensed the drug to uh, Norgene, and that gave a huge amount of credibility. I think people felt that this drug was a, was a wrecked drug, but in fact, Norgene came along, they gave us 11 million pounds up front, I've got more details on this later, and uh, various development milestones and sales milestones, and a, a healthy royalty. Uh, but you can see there, the, the, the share price still barely, barely moved. And then through the fourth quarter, we announced that we were, had filed our application for the US and in mid-December the FDA told us that they'd accepted our filing and, and confirmed that that PDUFA date for the review uh, would be in uh, July of this year. Uh, and, and it's really, you know, we put all these, this, these this bits of the jigsaw, if you like, the company back together again. And, and then I think having done that, we said we've really, you can imagine the investor relations activity after that disaster was, 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 if it existed at all, by the way, I joined the company in August, so I wasn't around at that time, but it was damage limitation. We've now got the story to tell, and we've started to tell it in the last uh, few months, and actually the closing uh, share price today was around 56 pence, market cap of about 65 million. So we're starting to see a recognition uh, of, of, of that this company has got some, some value in it. Let me tell you a bit about iron deficiency um, and, and how Ferrocrew fits into that. So um, one of the things that you get from iron deficiency is, is anemia, it's low levels of uh, um, red blood cells and haemoglobin, and there's a variety of uh, symptoms of anemia, uh, which you probably recognize and some which maybe, maybe, you, maybe you won't, but it's, it's, it's a widespread um, condition. And a lot of, um, sorry, a lot of anemia comes at the point at the bottom, comes from um, iron deficiency, and you treat iron deficiency uh, with iron replacement therapy. Uh, so iron deficiency is, uh, is the most common cause of anemia. Um, iron is required for multiple functions in your body, but in particular um, for the levels of hemoglobin. Uh, and it, uh, deficiency occurs when you're not absorbing enough iron through your, your food, or if you're losing iron through blood loss. Um, and so malnutrition, bleeding, and those sort of things come up in various chronic diseases, and in particular, inflammatory bowel disease and chronic kidney disease. And in those two areas, we have done clinical studies which demonstrate the, the effectiveness of, uh, of Ferrocrew. And these are IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, CKD, chronic kidney disease, are significantly prevalent diseases. And these charts go from 2017 to 2035, 2035 because we have patent protection for our drug out to 2035. Um, but you can see today on the left-hand market, we're talking about around about 15 million patients with these two diseases in 
the five biggest European markets and the US, and growing steadily with ageing, population growth, uh, uh, and so on. So these are in themselves are substantial markets, but this is only a subset of the entire iron deficiency uh, arena. So you can treat um, iron deficiency uh, either orally or intravenously. Um, essentially, the oral products historically are salt-based compounds. They're um, in, uh, inexpensive, they're convenient, um, but they, have, uh, they tend, what happens is you take a, um, a, a, an oral salt, it will break down as it goes through, through the gut, and you end up with sort of um, iron um, effectively clumping in your gut and causing constipation, nausea, vomiting, uh, and um, affecting the, the, the lining of the, of, the, of the gut. And as a result, it's, uh, the oral salts are pretty poorly tolerated, um, which, which creates obviously an issue for those, those people. Now, for more severe cases, you can go on to intravenous, um, but that requires a, a, literally a direct injection of an iron product into your blood supply. Uh, you have to go into hospital for that. It can, you can have a, a very significant reaction to it. It can be quite dangerous. Um, so the, dr the, the, the products themselves are expensive, and obviously the hospitalization costs are both inconvenient and expensive as, as, as well. And you can see there in terms of market volume, um, because virtually everybody will go on to the oral uh, treatment initially, that's where the big volume is. But in terms of pricing, most of the oral products at the moment are generic pricing, and the intravenous product on the right-hand side, uh, the lighter grey colour, um, you, essentially about half the, the market in value terms come through the intravenous uh, treatment because of the pricing of those, those products, which are mainly patented products. So why is ferrocru uh, novel? In what way is it novel? So what, what I, I said a moment ago, that the salts break down as they go through the gut, and, and so you lose a lot of the iron um, uh, before it gets to where it needs to. Uh, you can be treated, an iron salt tablet can be contain two or three hundred milligrams of, of iron, and a lot of that doesn't get absorbed uh, where it needs to be. Ferrocru is different. Ferrocru is an Fe3 plus iron surrounded by three essentially sugar molecules, maltol. Um, and they bind very, very tightly until it gets close to in the duodenum where most of the iron gets absorbed when the strength of this natural body process is strong enough to pull the iron out of that conglomeration um, and it pulls it into the body and, and then the body uses it as, as it needs to. And the maltol, which is essentially a sugary uh, stuff, which is actually used quite often in the food industry, simply gets uh, discharged through, through the body um, in, in a natural way. So there are, there are really very, very few side effects from this treatment, and most of the iron that we, treat, we, we give in the capsule gets to where it needs to. And as a result, I said two or, two or three hundred milligrams for an iron salt tablet, our caps, capsules are 30 milligrams. So you, we're treating, giving far less uh, iron. So where do we position ferrocru in, in the sort of overall treatment? So you get a patient treatment with iron deficiency, pretty much all of them will initially go on to oral iron. And some, going down the, this route, will be tolerant. Uh, and, and because the drugs are cheap, fine, let, let those people, that, that, that work. if it works for them, we're not going to try and capture that market. But if you're intolerant, uh, and uh, some studies say that ranges from 50 to 70% of the patients, so a huge uh, population, you've either got, you've got two choices. Either you give up, and you just put up with your symptoms, whatever they are, or you go down the intravenous route, which, as I say, is expensive, inconvenient, um, and, um, and, and unpleasant. Um, so what we, we are now being able to offer with Ferrocru is two alternatives. Either, instead of giving up, take Ferrocru, so that's what grows the market, or, instead of going down the intravenous route, take Ferrocru, which, takes, which should enable us to take some of the, um, the intravenous market. And, and we are aiming to price, and Norgene, our commercial partners in Europe, are pricing this at around the same price as the intravenous product. So we're not priced at generic rates, uh, prices, we're, we're priced at the, um, at the high, higher intravenous uh, product rates. But of course, we're saving the system all the costs of hospitalization and so on. So we, we, we can offer a good economic case, even though we're charging those sorts of uh, rates. And just down here to note, as I mentioned earlier on, patent protection out to 2035. Clinical studies. The first clinical study the company did was in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the top chart shows you what happened over the 12 weeks, which was where we got to the primary endpoint. And that basically says that uh, we got a, uh, an, uh, a, the, the sort of increase in hemoglobin that you need from 11 up to um, 13 or 14 or 
um, which is the sort of, the sort of level where you're, you're normalizing and stabilizing. Uh, so we saw a very relevant increase in, in hemoglobin over the 12 weeks. And then the middle chart is over the 52-week, um, sorry, I think it's 64-week follow-up uh, for this one. And um, you can see there that the, the, the levels are sustained out, out over that period. And the bottom chart basically says it's well tolerated. The, um, the, the blue is ferrocrew, the red is placebo, and we had similar sorts of adverse effects uh, during the, the study uh, to a placebo. This is the detailed story of the um, chronic kidney disease study, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this, but this is how we sort of, what happened and how we, we um, retrieved the situation. Essentially, uh, the, he the first, the, what, what caused the, the, the damage was we got top line data out of the clinical uh, research organization that conducted the study, and that top line data masked the fact that some of the patients who had been treated with ferrocrew uh, actually had severe blood losses towards the end, and therefore their hemoglobin levels suddenly went down. <coughs> And some of the patients who were being treated by placebo, who weren't improving, um, because of other effects, they had to be treated emergent, with emergency um, intravenous or other, other therapy, so their hemoglobin went up. In the initial data, we couldn't see any of that. We just, all we saw was there didn't, wasn't much difference between the two products at the end of the study. Once we'd adjusted for those confounding events, actually the separation was right. So Ferrocrew actually delivered a much better result than the placebo. But it was only that six, after those six weeks in, in towards the middle to end of March uh, last year when all that full information was, was seen. Uh, um, and actually recently we've published some long ter the long-term data from the um, uh, study. And this is the original data for the 12 weeks. And so... Uh, you can see here that after correcting, the benefits at week 8 uh, maintained themselves out to week 16. In the, in the top-line data, this all disappeared. So that was, the, that was the puzzle. It was great here, and it had all disappeared by week 16. But what you can see in the long-term follow-up is these are the patients who were originally on, the, uh, on, on Ferrocrew going out to 16 weeks. These were the patients originally on placebo. And after the first the 16 weeks, we were allowed to move the placebo patients onto Ferrocrew. And you can see they then reacted in exactly the same way as the Ferrocrew arm had done 16 weeks earlier. So really good, nice, nice long-term evidence uh, that this is uh, a, a, a valuable product. Tim, Tim you've got about four minutes. OK. Um, so um, we've got some other studies going on at the moment. Um, the main one, or sorry, there, there, there are two here, that the, the bottom one is a phase three pediatric study, uh, which the European authorities have asked us to do. At the moment, we're only approved for adults. This will allow us, uh, if it's successful, to go right down into uh, treating, treating uh, children. The one in the middle, the head-to-head -head study, uh, this actually is going to report um, by the end of this quarter. So it's, it's going to be news uh, some, sometime fairly soon. And this is where we have, it's not a regulatory study. The regulators ask you to essentially compare your drug against placebo. This is where we've gone head-to-head -head against the market-leading intravenous product because we, what we want to try and demonstrate is that actually if you treat your patient with your oral ferrocrew, it's as good as uh, treating them with the intravenous uh, treatment. And clearly from a marketing point of view and a pricing point of view, that could be a, a valuable result to get. But if we don't get it, it's not a disaster because, as I say, it doesn't, it doesn't impact the approvals. Um, um, in terms of European commercialization, I mentioned we've licensed it to, uh, to Norgene. Uh, we got an £11 million pound up front. Uh, we're entitled, if, if we have success, to uh, an extra €54 million uh, Euros in both the mix of development and sales milestones. And we will get royalties ranging from 25% to uh, 40%. Uh, I won't go into this much detail, but you know, Norgene are a, a very credible company. Um, they're, they're sort of mid-size. We didn't want one of the giants because, frankly, this product probably wouldn't be interesting enough to them. But uh, Norgene are highly motivated, and they already operate with the same sort of doctors and so on who you need to promote these sorts of drugs, uh, drugs to. We retain responsibility for manufacturing, future uh, development, and, of course, we own the, intellectual pro uh, the overarching intellectual property. In the US, uh, we filed and uh, we'll get an answer uh, around the end of July unless the government has another close down o over there. And commercializing, we're most likely to outline some of the product there uh, as well. In terms of financial headlines, um, the, we put out an unaudited trading statement uh, in January. 
Um, 11.9 million of revenues in 2018, of which 11 million was that upfront that we received. Uh, we've got cash of nearly 10 million at the end of the year with the cash runway going into uh, 2020. Um, in terms of news flow, we've got those head-to-head -head study date, data coming out um, quite soon. Uh, we've got the PDUFA date for the US in uh, 27th of July and the start of the pediatric study. We're still doing the preparatory work for it at the moment, designing the protocol. Uh, we need to find and appoint a um, contract research organization uh, to do the work for us. Um, but that should start in the second half of the year. And then ongoing, uh, um, we are continuing to look at out licensing. So there's the US, which in due course, hopefully we'll be able to do a licensing deal for, uh, but also uh, other territories outside, uh, outside the US and Europe. So key messages and investment highlights. This is a major market um, and there are significant unmet needs because, it's because of the tolerability um, uh, issues. Uh, Ferrocrew is novel in the way that it works. Uh, we've got the, uh, the, the US coming, we've got other parts of the world coming, we've got uh, a, a fairly healthy cash position. Um, and we, have, we believe we have a valuation upside as a result of the, if you like, the, the, the calamity that happened uh, last year. Um, and we've got, um, and we're now um, covered by uh, Peel Hunt and uh, Liberum, who are our brokers. Um, and uh, Liberum actually recently updated their note and uh, put a, a, a price of, um, I think it's about £1.10 uh, on us, including the US opportunity. Peel Hunt put a note out at the time of the Norgene deal and they said 70 to 80 pence, excluding the US, and you can double that if, you've got, if you get the, the, the US approval and, uh, and, and, and licensing deal. Um, and also um, Edison cover us, they've got 150 for the total business, including the US. So you can see there that they, all those analysts think, uh, compare that with today's share price of 56p, uh, that there's a, there's, there's a healthy upside. But that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions uh, from the audience. There's one over there. And I apologise, our Chief Medical Officer was going to come with me, but he unfortunately wasn't able to. So the, your more medical questions, I'm afraid I'm probably not going to be able to, able to answer. Okay, um, have you got any guidance you can give us on pricing and what Norgina is saying about the price they can achieve? And second part um, to the question is, what kind of distribution capability does, does Norgina have in the United States? Um, so pricing, Norgina don't have any uh, real presence in the United States, so... Um, it's, it's pretty unlikely we'll do a deal with them in the, in the US. Uh, in terms of pricing in Europe, it's around the uh, sort of two euro. It's, it varies from country to country. At the moment, we're only launched, uh, we, the, the product is only launched in the UK and Germany because traditionally those are the markets where you can go to and you can set your own price. And for, as far as the, the other big European markets, France, Spain and Italy, uh, typically there you have to go through a price negotiation before you can launch. Norgene have said, and there's a bit, an element of crossing your fingers here, we don't want to go and have those pricing discussions until we've seen the head-to-head -head data, because if we get good head-to-head -head data, then we can argue for a, for, a, for a better price. But I think you're looking at the sort of two euros per day mark for the, for the treatment, and the treatment is two 30 milligram capsules per day. Could I just ask then, um, as far as the US is concerned, um, assuming that the, F, uh, the FDA does um, accept the products and admit it to, to market. Um, who, who, you'll be looking for a distribution partner there as well? We will, yep. And that's, and that's a process that's, that's underway, but it's, it's still early yet. And, and I don't think we would want to uh, conclude irrevocably a deal before, and I don't think the other party would want to conclude a deal before we get their approval one way or the other. Okay, thank you for that. This is another question over, thank you so much. over there, Don. Uh, can you tell, tell us a bit about where your costs are going and what the variables are, please? Yep. Um, so, a bit, when the, uh, before, w w at the time that the um, data problem happened a year ago, the company had, um, had set its heart on commercialising for itself, certainly in Europe, and had started to build uh, commercial organisations in the UK and Germany, because those were the first markets. Um, the day all this happened, the, the share price collapsed, the company was relatively short of cash and just took the view that it could no longer support those commercial organisations. So it took out um, 
all the, all, all the selling and commercial uh, uh, organization, and along with that downsized the back office uh, and, and so on. So I can't point you to an exact uh, number uh, at the moment in, in terms of comparing, looking at 2017 or 2018 because you know, the costs were coming down like that. That said, um, you know, we've probably got a, a general and admin sort of cost of running the business in the region of about five million pounds. The variable is how much R&D cost do we put on, on top of that? And I'm afraid that bounces around all over the place. During the course of 2019, we've got the tail end of um, the costs from the head-to-head -head study and still some residual costs from the, um, uh, the chronic kidney disease study because we did the, the, the follow-up. Um, we have we will have, towards the second half of the year, in the second half of the year, we will have the paediatric costs beginning to start. Um, and in the meantime, we've got um, some formulation work we're doing. So, for example, for the paediatric study, we can't ask small children to take capsules. We have to, we're going to have to give them a liquid. So we're formulating that at the moment. So I'm afraid the R&D piece is, is, is a bit of a moving uh, piece. But you've got the sort of underlying bedrock at the moment of costs to keep the business running and so on of about, about five million plus on top of that, uh, you know, R&D costs. Thank you. Okay, is there a final question? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> of course, there's the opportunity to ask Tim questions uh, privately uh, afterwards. Um, and again, I'll remind you about the feedback form, so please uh, fill in those forms as you go along. We'll be very grateful for that. The third company tonight is, uh, is a life science company as well, but it's in a rather different field, Collagen Solutions, uh, that has spoken at this event before. Um, develops, manufactures and supplies medical-grade collagen biomaterials for use in research, medical devices and regenerative medicine. Uh, growth in the market for biomaterials is, uh, is driven by demographics and innovation. And collagen is well positioned for growth through multiple growth initiatives uh, on a foundation of existing revenue and a growing customer base and a number of proprietary products uh, nearing launch. Uh, Jamal Rushdie is with us tonight, the CEO. Jamal, over to you. Well, thank you to Hardman for uh, hosting this event. And uh, I see a few of our shareholders here in the audience, so thanks for, for attending. And for those of you new, I'm really uh, excited here to present the opportunity with Collagen Solutions. So um, let's talk really quickly about uh, just the investment value proposition here. There's, there's really th three things to consider. First of all, um, as was alluded to, the, the market for biomaterials is high growth and sustainable, and it's driven by some natural underlying uh, drivers in terms of demographics, innovation within materials, and it goes across a number of segments. So this is not a single, single medical device segment. It's multiple segments within medical device. In particular, Collagen Solution is very well positioned for growth. Um, we do have multiple growth initiatives, so it's not a single study that has to come out uh, good or bad, or it's not a single market that has to come out uh, good or bad. We've, we've been placing the seeds of the last three to four years and very happy to see um, on the cusp a number of those investments being realized. And then finally, you can't do this without a team. I'm proud to say we've got a phenomenal team that we've put together for Collagen Solutions. Um, we have experience, uh, many of us within uh, decades of experience in medical device, um, and we've also had experience in biomaterials, and many of us have been in the smaller company environment transitioning into uh, bigger companies through acquisition um, and been able to create uh, value for our shareholders uh, across a number of investments. So we do have a track record of, uh, of making this work. So let's talk about the underlying demographics. What's driving uh, the, the opportunity? So what's interesting is um, by 2030, um, one billion people will be over the age of 65, and that's growing at five times the rate of the rest of the world's population, so uh, of, of any other demographic. So um, we are having an aging population, and what happens with aging is there's two things. There's the expectation of improved quality of life as we age. So no longer are we satisfied at 65 years old, 75 years old, um, with uh, dealing with, uh, with suffering. So there is an expectation for even continued sport, continued activity. The downside of aging, of course, is also increased uh, amount of chronic disease uh, that happens. So with, uh, with this aging population, there is both the expectation for prolonged activity and the need to deal with some of these disease treatments. So in biologic materials, there's a lot of innovation that are happening. 
um, cartilage for arthritis in the knee, so, so improving um, uh, walking and gait in the knee. Synthetic bone grafting when it comes to spine surgery is an area of biologics. Um, diabetes is a big, uh, a big problem associated with obesity and aging that biologic therapies can help with the wounds associated with, bio, uh, with uh, diabetes. Um, heart valves have now become minimally invasive, believe it or not. You can go into the cath lab and get a replacement heart valve uh, these days, again, based on some biologic materials. And then finally, as uh, people age and their teeth need to be replaced, there's biologic therapies uh, approach to that. So the, none of this is science fiction. None of this is tomorrow. These are all innovations that are happening today, and Collagen Solutions is, is a part of all of this. So getting to what we do, uh, we develop uh, biomaterials and medical devices, and these are typically meant to restore structure and function of damaged tissues and organs. So we'll get into some examples of that of what we do. So we see a number of vertical markets here in, in medical uh, device. Um, in cardiovascular, our, our tissues are used in minimally invasive heart valves. In orthopedics, our collagens and our products are used for bone grafting and the healing of cartilage and knees. In dental, we use our collagens and other products to restore the bed upon which these dental implants are, uh, are implanted. And then collagen, finally, is a very natural um, wound healing agent. So across wound healing, which is especially prevalent uh, with, with diabetic patients, uh, collagen is used in a number of these areas. Those are the major markets that we're in. Uh, we also are in the front end of research. So collagen is used in some of the more advanced research that's going on. It's not a lot of revenue for us, but it's important to be at the forefront of regenerative medicine uh, so that when these therapies ultimately get to clinic and ultimately get into development, we're at the, at the beginning of that as well. So those are the, some of the major markets that we serve today. So from a business model perspective, we do about 4 million pounds in revenue uh, today. Um, our core business is 100% of that revenue, where we supply, develop, and manufacture both collagens and tissues uh, made from animal sources uh, for many medical applications. Um, we have several growth drivers that's uh, in driving the growth of our underlying core business. So one thing that we've been doing over the past three years is moving up the value chain. So three years ago, we were mostly a supplier of raw materials. Uh, medical grade collagens and tissues, we'd supply it to other manufacturers, and those manufacturers would then make their own products. What's happened is um, we've been moving up the value chain where we're actually now developing products for these companies using our raw materials, and in fact making some of our own products. What that translates into is where before we might have captured 2 to 5% of the average selling price of a medical device, now moving into development and ultimately con contract manufacturing, it's more like 30 to 40% of the average selling price. So that has been happening uh, over the past uh, few years, especially this year's, where we really see the step change. We've also been broadening our offering of tissue products, again, from very simple uh, one product company to multiple species and multiple types of tissues for medical device companies. And then finally, uh, three years ago, we started an initiative to build a sales organization so we can expand geographically. So we now have business development professionals in the United States, uh, in Europe, and in Asia to go deeper into those markets. And those are all um, our key drivers that's been growing our core business. Now, on top of that core business, what we can do is we can leverage the expertise and the contacts we have uh, to develop some of our proprietary products. And these are products that we will take all the way through the regulatory approval process, um, getting feedback from surgeons and, and some of our partners in industry. And our first lead product is nearing launch. And that's a product that I'll get into a little bit more, but it's a scaffold to regenerate the cartilage in a damaged knee. And that's a, a really a game-changing product for us and, and indeed we believe the industry. So that's our business model. Core business with on top of that new products that are coming out. Um, here's been a little bit of our history of our revenue trend. Um, we've been growing nicely over the last several years. Uh, last year we also had a challenging year that we uh, had to recover from. Uh, a couple of customers um, had some challenges with either funding or their own product that they had to step back. We believe nearly all that will come back in the future. Um, but even with those challenges, we ended up growing in the first half of this year. Our fiscal year ends on March 31st. So we reported out um, in December, we reported out our first six months of this year. And uh, despite um, some significant customer challenges, we grew by 13%. 
In fact, with one customer that uh, will come back, uh, we, we believe in the future, if you take that one customer out, uh, we grew by 55%. So we've really been growing the baseline of the business. Uh, one leading metric is the number of new customers that we onboard every six month period. We onboarded new nine new customer contracts in the first six months, and that was a record for the company. So we're really seeing the momentum um, uh, coming through in terms of customer growth. We've been growing in China, so we did an initiative. Uh, we had a couple of challenges early on to figure out the right path. We believe we found some good opportunities. Um, two new distributors, and we've uh, started to realize our first sales in China. And then our tissue business has been taking off with four of the new customers uh, coming through there. And then finally, in terms of moving up the value chain, moving from raw materials to development and then contract manufacturing, 50% of our revenue this year is coming from um, development contracts that then translates into contract manufacturing when th once those products are approved. And that's up from, say, 5 to 10% from years past. So we've really significantly changed the mix, and we've been moving up the value chain in our core business. So we're quite pleased with the first six months of the year, and we'll be reporting out um, our full-year revenue uh, after March 31st, likely in the early April time frame with a, with a top-line un unaudited number. So that's a bit of our core business of what we do, and now I want to focus a little bit on our first proprietary product that's coming out, which is called Contramimetic. So this is for disease of cartilage in the knee. If you know people have painful knees, the cartilage gets worn, worn down, this is one of the therapies and treatments to, to intervene and we believe prevent some of the spread of the disease uh, over time. It's an arthroscopic procedure, and that's a, what's known over here in, in, uh, in Europe as a keyhole procedure. Two very small incisions, maybe three, with a camera and, uh, and some instruments. It comes in a, a complete kit, as you see there. And what's interesting is it's not only cost effective, but it's going to be backed by eight years of long-term follow-up data. So this is almost unheard of, is to be able to launch a product with this type of data behind it. And we're very excited about the data that, uh, that we see. So we'll talk a little bit about what happens to a knee as it ages. So you start there on the left with a healthy, pristine knee. Um, it's a very shiny, white uh, surface that takes the loads of, of walking, running, jumping, etc. And then, either be just because of wear and tear, because of age, or perhaps an injury, you start with a small defect. Now that defect can grow over time into late osteoarthritis, where the bulk of your knee is damaged, and then you have to go to a metal and plastic knee. So that's the end stage of arthritis, potentially to even have to be revised down the road. So what we'd like to do is intervene in this area um, before we have to get to that total knee progression, or at least to prevent and delay that uh, progression, which will save the, the, the healthcare system billions of dollars over time. So again, we're at that late, or excuse me, that early stage where uh, currently there's about a million cartilage procedures worldwide performed to address this problem. And frankly, many of those procedures don't work very well in the long term. They're not sustainable. We believe we can address about a third of those on a global basis uh, through our technology, and that's going to be the earlier stage uh, cartilage defects. So, so what makes us different with this product, and how is it how is it going to be effective? It's hitting that sweet spot of can we be cost effective? Can we show long-term durability of the data? And it's just human nature. Is it easy to use for the surgeon? Because if it's a, if, if it's a big learning technique, it's going to limit, uh, excuse me, hurdle, it's going to limit adoption. So we've developed a therapy that we believe is going to be about 10% of the cost of some of the more expensive cell-based therapies that do work fairly well, but they're very costly and they're very time-consuming and difficult to do. We, we're going to show eight year, we have shown eight year long term follow up data that shows the effic uh, efficacy. And then finally, it's exactly in the current technique that the surgeons know how to use today. And it really doesn't add any time to the surgical operation of the techniques that we're doing today. So we think this is going to hit the sweet spot of all three of those areas. So um, cost effective, easy to prove, that's just math. Ease of use is very uh, similar to the procedure today. So let's talk about the, the durability and how can we prove that. So uh, this was the subject of a very long-term clinical trial that we were fortunate enough to get some of the early patients back, um, and we were able to image them and get the functional data from uh, 15 of the 17 original patients. The first thing we looked about is, does our scaffold, which is our product, refill um, acceptably the bone and the cartilage and the defect that we've created? Current standards of care is maybe 50 to 70% of the defect being filled. 
Here we saw 95% of the defect being filled, and those are the individual patients. So they're very consistent. It's not like we had a, a few anomalies. So we're very happy with the fill. So we know we can fill the cartilage, but will it last? And there's two ways to know if it lasts. One is you get the clinical scores, but the other one is you can image the, it, and with new techniques, we can tell if we're regrowing scar tissue, which is why some of the current uh, therapies don't last very long, or are we actually regenerating normal native cartilage. And from this next part of the study, we were able to image that. And so it's a bit technical, but what you'll see here is an eight-year time period. The blue is chondromimetic. It's the signal that measures normal cartilage. And the green is what a normal cartilage signal looks like. Now, we looked at the first um, few weeks. We looked at three months, and we looked at six months. And those are the early time points on the right. And we saw a very rapidly converging to normal native cartilage. And then we looked eight years later, and the statisticians and the data could tell absolutely no difference uh, between normal native hyaline cartilage and, uh, and on this test and then our regenerative um, uh, scaffold. So we were absolutely amazed by this data. We thought it was going to be close, but this is statistically um, indistinguishable. In fact, the error bars, you can't even see them. So we're very, very happy with how this came out from a regenerative process. So that satisfies us scientifically. And then what's important is how does it work clinically? What do, how do the patients feel? And there, again, we are very, very happy. The top graph is a longitudinal graph of a functional score, which basically measures patients' pain, quality of life, sports, et cetera. And anything in the scoring range between 80 and 100 is considered excellent. And we saw that we had early very, very good results, or excellent results after the first six months. Um, but we found that was sustained over an eight-year period. And this is thinking about someone aging normally over eight years is not going to have the same level of function either. So we're able to see very normal um, and sustained uh, functional results over that eight-year time period. The second graph, which you see on the bottom right here, um, these are subsets of a different type of clinical score that we looked at we compared against these cell therapy uh, that cost 10 to 20 times as much. And what we found is on every measure, the symptoms, the pain, the quality of life, the activities of daily living, the return to sport, we were equal to, if not better, these products that cost 10 times as much. So we think not only do we have a very good ar argument on an absolute basis, but relative cost of the healthcare system, we can show some very good results in these early stages that you don't need to spend uh, as much on the cell therapies, and it's much easier for the surgeon to do. So we're very excited about this product. So we need to launch it. John, Sorry. About two, minutes. two minutes, that's all I need. So our next step. Uh, first, we're going to launch it in Europe, and then we're going to follow on very quickly in Asia. The US will be a little bit longer of a clinical trial, so we'll have to find a partner for that. We've submitted for the CE mark. We're simply waiting for approval. Um, that they've started the review as of early January. We have not heard back yet. We're hopeful to, to, to hear back very soon. We've already signed up distributors ahead of the CE mark, so there's a lot of excitement around that. We've got our key early distributors um, identified in Europe. And in fact, we've also started to license this in Asia. So in Indonesia and in Malaysia um, and in South Korea, we've started the process there. As soon as that's available, we'll be beginning our first surgeries with our key opinion leaders. And then we'll be launching the product um, um, both in Europe and Asia. So just in conclusion, our catalysts, uh, our news flow, if you will, over the, uh, over the coming uh, months and, and next year, We'll be continuing to grow the core business as we get new agreements. We have a very healthy deal pipeline. We have milestones upcoming from our existing development projects. Some of our customers' products are about to launch, which will pull through on our supply side. And then we see acceleration in our tissue business coming through. We'll be launching Chondromimetic as soon as we get the CE mark with first limited user release and then expanding our distribution from there. And then finally, it's important to invest in the future. So we have a, a pipeline of products behind that. And in fact, just recently, we announced 1.5 million pounds of support on a matching grant, 40% matching grant from the Scottish government, since we're headquartered in Scotland, to continue to fund our R&D and our innovation. So we have a pretty aggressive vision to be the industry's first choice in regenerative biomaterials. And uh, we look forward to getting there. Thank you. Jamal, thank you for that. Uh, uh, are there any questions in the audience? There's a question over here. 
Uh, just a little one I should probably ask the previous speaker as well. Um, do you uh, expect any um, issues around uh, Brexit with regard to yourselves and to Europe, or are, are life science products exempt from that? Um, the short answer is we don't expect a major impact um, right now. Our, our notified body is, uh, is Dutch anyway. Our distributors are going to be set up there. There's probably going to be some incremental costs and inefficiencies uh, that would happen. I don't think that's uh, uh, really unique to our industry. Um, and the regulatory environment, we believe, is going to stay fairly consistent. Um, down the road, who knows? So far, all the analysts are saying it should be business as usual. But we do keep a watchful uh, eye open in case any of that starts changes. But whatever happens to us, I think, is going to impact the, the industry overall. But so far, what we've heard is from a regulatory environment should be business as usual. We do expect some inefficiencies in terms of potential extra inventory to be staged in certain areas, especially in the short term and, and, and uncertainty. Thank you. Is there a second question from the audience? There's one there. <laughs> so ask, wait, when the, um, that particular uh, problem for the uh, overcoming the knee problem, when that's going to come onto the market, do you think? So uh, it could be weeks and it could be a few months. We're not exactly sure. It's, it's certainly not years. Um, the process for getting approvals, we submit all the data to our notified body to get the CE mark. They then have a chance to answer or to ask us questions that we have to answer, or they just approve it. Um, typically, we would expect one or two rounds of questions. Each round could be four to six weeks. We haven't received our first round of questions yet, so it's a bit of a waiting game, but it could be weeks or a few months. That's our best guess right now. Okay, uh, and I think there's a final. Then, how would that get, get into in surgery? Um, you know, that, that would uh, take time to do that as well, wouldn't no, it? No, it's fairly quick following the approval because of our distribution network. Oh, right. Okay, I think there's another final question at the back. Um, I just wanted you, you mentioned you had a customer who was a fairly substantial customer who went away. Yes. What, what, can you tell us a bit more about why yes. that was? Yes, uh, we, we talked about this fairly publicly. We had a, a customer in South Korea uh, that we had a five-year contract with with certain minimums, and they were very honorable and honored their minimums, but their sales haven't gone uh, as fast, so they've ended up building up some ex excess inventory. It's going to take them a little time to work through it. We're still in contact and have a very good relationship, so as soon as they work through that inventory, we expect it to come back. Okay, thank you. Obviously, a chance to ask questions uh, in the uh, uh, private session afterwards. Thank you very much. Great, everyone. thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the final uh, company speaking tonight is uh, Anglo-Asian Mining. Um, we've got the uh, CFO with us, Bill Morgan. Now, I think most investors know that uh, essentially gold is an uncorrelated uh, asset for difficult times. I guess the question is, why Anglo-Asian? Well, the, the gold mining sector is full of companies that have got holes and prospects, but not much more at this stage, whereas Anglo-Asian is highly cash generative. It's got a, it's a miner of gold, silver and copper from three mines in Azerbaijan. Listed on AIM in 2005, produced its first gold in 2009, paid its first dividend in 2018, um, and the balance sheet moved into a net cash position. Yesterday announced dividend guidance for this calendar year of six US cents on a share price of 82 pence. Bill, over to you. Uh, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Bill Morgan. I'm the CFO of Anglo-Asian Mining. Um, Keith has just actually been through all of the best bits, so I can keep this, I can keep this presentation very short. Um, this is a group overview of the company. We're very established. As Keith said, we were listed on AIM in 2005. We produced gold in 2009. We've got a very experienced ball and very strong management. And we've got an excellent relationship with the government in Azerbaijan, which is a very stable jurisdiction. Um, I like to joke about the fact that the company politically is more stable than the one we're sitting in at the moment, but I don't think that would be a, a very good idea as you all have to live here. Um, our main site is uh, Gedebe in western Azerbaijan. This is in the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains. And there we've got our three mines and our processing facilities. 
and we've got very highly developed infrastructure. We've got very good road access. Uh, we've got a substation at site which we built where we get power from the grid. And as well as being a producing company, we've got a very good pipeline of exploration projects and potential for future mines. Uh, give you an idea of the uh, production and the financials of the company. We've got growing production. Last year, and this is calendar years, we did just over 83,000 gold equivalent ounces. That's gold, uh, silver and copper. We're guiding this year for 82 to 86,000 gold equivalent ounces of production. Our financial years are calendar. Uh, we've not released the results yet for the full year of 2018. The last financial results we uh, released for the six months to June of last year where we posted revenues of 40 million and profit before tax of just over 8 million. And we currently have net cash. We're a very low cost producer. Um, if you look at the gold industry, the last AISC, all in sustaining cost, uh, that we actually released on the market was the six months to June of last year where we had a cost of $543 per ounce, which is very low. Um, this is partly because we're very well served with infrastructure and we're an efficient company, um, but partly because Azerbaijan is a very cheap country to actually operate and do business in. Uh, as I said, or Keith said, um, we just paid our first dividend last year because of the, the good cash flow that we had. And we've got a dividend policy of targeting 25% of free cash flow each year by way of two dividends each year, an interim and a final, which are roughly uh, equal. And we paid our first maiden dividend of uh, three US cents. Uh, we declare in uh, dollars, but we actually pay in, uh, in sterling using exchange rate close to when we pay the dividend. Uh, this is uh, to give you some idea of the shareholders of the company. If I can get the button working. Um, Risa Vaziri and Governor John Sununu, they hold just <coughs> under 40% uh, of the company, and they were actually the founders of the company. Um, between them, the rest of the directors and the senior management, we own just over 41% of the company. So, you know, we're very much invested in what we're doing. Uh, last year, the company had a, a very, very good share price run. We basically doubled the share price from around 40 to around 80, and that was on the back of the very good results that we announced, plus the um, dividend that we announced. Can you still hear me without the yeah, mic? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm getting confused here with microphones. Um, and we will be releasing our full year uh, 2018 financial results in the middle of May, and we're going to have an annual general meeting on the 20th of June. Okay, as I said, we've got a very strong team. Uh, Risa Azeri, he set the company up. He's a very prominent Azeri, uh, or he's a very prominent businessman in Azerbaijan. He's originally of Iranian extraction, but he's now a US citizen. He's been doing business in Azerbaijan for a very long time. Uh, he's a personal friend of the president, and uh, we're very well connected and part of the political establishment. Um, he set the business up with, along with uh, Governor John Sununu. He was the chief of staff to the first president, George Bush. Uh, Cosro, he's our non-executive chairman. He's in his 70s. He spent a long career with the IFC and World Bank, and he now acts as uh, a non-exec chairman for various companies in that part of the world where he did a lot of work for uh, those institutions. We've got Richard and John, they're both uh, English, uh, they're non-execs from uh, the finance and the technical disciplines. John is actually sitting here in the audience. And in terms of the management, we've got myself, who's a CFO, Farhang, who's our technical director, and Stephen, who's our geologist, and he's Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is uh, a little bit about Azerbaijan. It's, as you can say, it's a small country on the, uh, on the Caspian Sea. Uh, we, run the off we run the company from the, the capital in Baku, and as I say, our three sites are Geda Bay, which is the main operating site of the company in the uh, Caucasus Mountains. We've got another site, at, or another concession at Gosha, which we've got a small uh, underground mine. And we've got Ordabad in the Nakhivan um, enclave of Azerbaijan, which is an early stage uh, project where we're doing some geological work. Uh, this is a, an, an overview of the Gedebek site. 
Um, this is about one mile from the village of Gedebate, which is by a main road. And there we have the main open pit mine there. Uh, we have a, a mine camp and we have offices. Uh, we have our processing facilities there. We've got a second open pit mine, which we call Ugo, which is four and a half kilometers from the processing facilities. And this is along a road that we built to actually get access to it. And we also have a, an underground mine there called Gadir, which is the portal, which is situated 600 meters from the, from the processing facilities. And as I say, this is well served by road. We've got uh, power from the grid. Um, we've got a local labor supply. So it's very easy to, uh, to operate there. Uh, this is a quick uh, summary of our three mines.